I'm Bill Richardson, the uh, first director of the graduate program in health policy and planning at the School of Public Health and Community Medicine at the University of Washington. We started in 1971, although I was recruited in 1970 to the School of Medicine uh, and the Division of Health Services, which was at that time headed up by uh, Dr. Robert Day. Uh, Bob, of course, subsequently became the chair of the department, and by the time I got there on the 1st of January of 1971, I had already been quite involved with both the what was the division and then the Department of Health Services, getting funding for the program. We In, in those days, and it's still true today, it's a competitive world and we had to work from scratch to get funding for the program, for faculty positions and support positions. And then I also, while I was still at the University of Chicago, which is where I was being recruited from, had gone to Washington, read through all of the training grants related to programs of this sort, had written a proposal, sent it in to Bob, who subsequently put it through the university machinery, so that by the time I got there, we had the funding in place for the students and we had the funding in place for the faculty and staff to support the program. So I, I was doing kind of double duty for a while there while I was at the University of Chicago as an instructor and finishing up my research there and completing my dissertation and then actually moving to Seattle to start the program. One of the things that, uh, and I'll go back in a minute to where I came from, but one of the things that I thought was very important, and Bob Day as well, was that we get off to a very fast start because we wanted to have this program be very distinctive mm -hmm be one that balanced the strengths and sort of eliminated the weaknesses of some of the other programs that we had seen around the country in the health policy and health administration areas. And so we thought that it would be important, first of all, to recruit a class even before I got there. And so on one of my trips, I recruited the first class to enter uh, six months essentially after I got there. And the idea was that we wanted to have that class graduate in two years. And if we had a class that was already graduating, by the time we put in our application to the university and to the state to get an approved, uh, what was called a group degree program, which involved the business school, the School of uh, Public Affairs, and was based in the, at what was then the School of Public Health and Community Medicine, that we'd be up, off to a much faster start. But I should go back a step, perhaps, and say I originally uh, went to Trinity College as an undergraduate, as a history major, but did quite a lot of reading on the health field and health policy issues and got very interested in those as well as in, in management of large institutions in the health field. And so that then led me to uh, New York and a fellow called George Bugby, who was had been the head of the University of Michigan Health System, then went on to become the CEO of the American Hospital Association, and then went to New York and ran the Health Information Foundation for a number of years, which was funded by the drug, the, uh, drug firms in their uh, more um, passive days, shall we say. And, but he was probably the best known man in the field. Uh, and so I was, it was suggested to me that I go and talk to him about where to go to graduate school for my work in health management and health policy. And he sort of smiled when I went to his office and said, well, he, he named the usual suspects, University of Michigan and Yale and Harvard and so forth. And he said, but tell you the truth, he said, I've decided to leave the Health Information Foundation and I'm going to head up the program at the University of Chicago. And he said, so I can't help but suggest that you go there. And so that was how I ended up going to the University of Chicago as to get my master's degree. And while I was there, I became a Kellogg Fellow. The Kellogg Foundation offered fellowships to uh, graduate students who were interested in areas that they were interested in. And I happened, it happened to coincide for me because I was interested in low-income neighborhoods and the ways in which people who were living in impacted neighborhoods and who had very few resources themselves were able to seek and receive care, uh, both on a primary care basis and managing chronic disease, but also in emergencies. And so that was also an interest of the Kellogg Foundations, 
the whole idea of community uh, health and community-based delivery from the perspective of the families and the patients rather than simply the professions. And so I received the fellowship and started working on projects as a master's student along these lines. And then I graduated. When I came back from what my residency, uh, part of my master's program at the University of Chicago, it was suggested to me by the faculty at Chicago that I consider going on and getting a PhD. And so I was fortunate enough to be able to get into a multidisciplinary doctoral program, which is characteristic of Chicago, has been for decades, which included the Department of Economics, the Graduate School of Business, the Department of Sociology, and the School of Medicine. And I was, my, my basic uh, coursework and prelims were in the Graduate School of Business. My dissertation was overseen largely by members of the Faculty of Sociology and Economics as well as the chair, Norman Bradburn, who was based in sociology and the Graduate, Graduate School of Business. He was also the, the uh, director of the National Opinion Research Center at the time, which played an important part in my doctoral dissertation. So I went through that program, and in the course of it, I, as, as I passed my prelims and went into working on the dissertation, I was very fortunate to become the principal investigator on a large uh, project intended to scope out, this was in the mid-60s, to scope out the appropriate sites around the country for neighborhood health centers. And so I went to work on that project, uh, which was fully federally funded on a, on a competitive basis. And it gave me a chance to get around to lots and lots of urban communities that were at that time in very difficult straits course, it was a very turbulent time in the society, but also to rural areas. For example, the San Luis mountain valleys, mountains and valleys up in the most northerly parts of New Mexico, uh, in which case I had, for example, to fly into Denver and then uh, on a charter through the Rockies and land in this very suspicious looking cornfield that served as an airport, and uh, in which the reason, the way the uh, air traffic controllers knew that a p plane was coming in was that we buzzed the local bar. And they would jump in a pickup truck, about five of them, and rush out to the field. And by the time we lined up to land, they were there, ready to flag us in and make sure there weren't any cattle in the field. And so there were some pretty remote areas. And uh, an another public health-related experience that I had in the San Luis Valley in northern New Mexico was that they were just putting in for the first time, a sanitary sewer system. And so before I got started asking people about health and the needs of the broader region and so forth, I ended up sitting down at a bar next to a fellow who was the superintendent of that project. And just to make conversation, I said, I don't really know all that much about uh, sanitary engineering and the way that sort of thing works. My public health background isn't in that area isn't that strong. He said, son, he said, there isn't a whole lot to know, except just count on gravity. <laughs> and so that's what I know about sanitary engineering. Anyway, that project gave me an opportunity then to develop some large-scale surveys in 10 sites around the United States on behalf of the what was at that time the, the uh, Office of Health Affairs of the Office of Economic Opportunity in, in the Executive Office of the President. So it, it had a lot of focus. Sergeant Shriver was the head of that program and quite a force at the time and, of course, a member of the Kennedy clan uh, or married to the Kennedy clan anyway and a force in his own right. So this opportunity to uh, do these surveys, to assess what was really needed and what people were saying about their health care uh, and the, the public health conditions and community health conditions as well as personal health care, was very, very useful to me. In addition, I was able to uh, get inserted in as sort of a quid pro quo, if you will, something called episodes of care uh, as a section of the survey in a few of these sites. And that shifted the uh, emphasis from r the usual uh, measurement of rates per thousand and that sort of thing in terms of services delivered or needs or morbidity, for example, uh, into 
designing something called an episode of care, which was not dependent on having sock care. And I won't go into how I, how I did that, but I was able to build it in to these surveys and then use those data for the dissertation that I subsequently did, which looked at the questions of the characteristics of members of the community, families essentially, on the one hand, as well as the physicians and clinics and hospitals in those communities and their characteristics, and whether or not, for example, people went to private practitioners or into group practices that were also fee-for-service or into public clinics. And I had the full range in a number of these communities to have enough variation to be able to really analyze what forces were influencing, what caused people to seek care or not seek care for themselves or their family members or their children. And also, once if they did choose to go, what happened to them once they got there. And the, the findings were really quite striking and startling, frankly, for the faculty at the University of Chicago. The principal finding was that the most important factor influencing both whether or not families sought care and the kinds of care that they received for those who did go was race. It was not income and it was not education. And there were some members of my dissertation committee, particularly from the economics department, who were a little suspicious that income wasn't the most important factor uh, or insurance coverage, but rather was race. But that turned out to be the case. And it was a widely cited, the publications that flowed from it were widely cited. Um, in some ways, I'm sorry to say they were widely cited, not so much because of the findings as because of the methodology. Because I was using episodes of care rather than the usual uh, kinds of data, I had to use maximum likelihood estimation rather than least squares estimation. And it, and it was a lot easier to use least squares. And what I showed at the end after I did a replication using least squares was that I didn't, I didn't have to have spent all the effort that I did in using what was the correct statistical approach, but that the least squares was adequate. And so a lot of the citations were footnotes that said, as Richardson has shown, there's no need to go to all that trouble. And uh, so, you know, I would rather have had more citations on race than uh, statistics, but I couldn't complain about the attention. Anyway, I was doing this work, and I got a call from Bob Day asking whether or not I would consider coming out to give a seminar at the university and consider a assistant professorship and the directorship of the new program that was being created in health administration and planning. And my first response was not very positive, to tell you the truth, because if you're at the University of Chicago, you get into this mindset that that's the only place really to be. But I, I did come home that evening and mentioned this call to my wife. She had been at the 1962 World's Fair, and she said, oh, Bill, you've got to go. She said, you don't have to take the job, but you've certainly got to go and see Seattle. It's spectacular. And so I went. I must say that the impact on me of that very first visit to the University of Washington was just stunning in the sense that first of all Bob Day and Tom Grayston and John Hogness had arranged a series of interviews of me but really of them if you will of people who were on the faculty all across the campus some in fields I was interested in and knew about and others that I didn't but the common trait was they all had been on the faculty at the University of Chicago. Okay. And so I talked to probably a dozen or 15 faculty members in different fields, all of whom said, of course, all I think all of those uh, leaders that I just mentioned were University of Chicago graduates or had been there. And the answer, of course, when I asked questions from all of them was, well, I mean, there's just no comparison between University of Chicago and the University of Washington. This this place really is on the move. It's very open. You can get terrific opportunities for interdisciplinary work. We're interested in community medicine. We're interested in the kinds of um, engagement of students, graduate students that you had when you were at Chicago and that we're encouraging here 
For example, Betty Gilson had arrived by that time and was very interested in rural health, particularly in western Washington. The WAMI program was underway, so we had, uh, or at least was beginning, funded by the Commonwealth Fund, and then, of course, later more substantially by the states, but Washington and Alaska, Montana, Idaho, and it was just a remarkable uh, example of what the University of Washington's reach could be and the opportunities for working with uh, communities of all sorts. And then I also had the opportunity to meet people from the community, Group Health Cooperative, which was of course a very unusual and uh, successful model of prepaid group practice. The Blue Cross and Blue Shield plans competed with each other in Washington, unlike anywhere else, with the physicians having started that program so that your services were paid in full if you, for physician services and then on an indemnity basis if you had hospital charges and just the reverse if you had Blue Cross. And so they were competing with each other and both of them were competing with Group Health Cooperative. So it was just the ideal setting for someone like me interested in organizational issues, financing issues, and health care for working class and, and lower income families. Mm -hmm. And so it was not difficult at that point to recruit me. And in fact, I remember going back to SeaTac after that couple of days. The mountain was out too, and it was June, so that helped. Mm -hmm. But I remember going back, and the only thing that I saw as a negative, this was in 1970, was that at three in the afternoon, there was quite a traffic jam going through downtown Seattle between the university to the north and SeaTac to the south. And so I thought, well, gee, it's, you know, maybe they'll build another freeway. And uh, fortunately, they never did, although there was an attempt made. So we, I then had that six months between the time that I said yes and the time that we actually moved. I had an obligation at the University of Chicago uh, to teach my graduate courses that fall quarter. And so I wasn't able to come at the beginning of the year, so of the school year. And so I had that opportunity, as I said earlier, to write the grants, develop the funding for the program, recruit a student body so that we'd have them ready to go the fall that, uh, of the year that I actually arrived. And I also had a chance in the course of traveling back and forth to meet the, the, the just remarkable uh, leaders originally of the divisions and then, of course, by the time I got there, of the departments uh, within the School of Public Health. And I'll probably say this again as we go along, but it's, it is, it has made such a deep impression on me, having subsequently then gone on uh, from the School of Public Health and Community Medicine to the Graduate School as Vice Provost for Research and Graduate Dean, and then from there to Executive Vice President at Pennsylvania State University, uh, where my appointment was in the School of Medicine, uh, but my offices were at University Park, which was the main campus, and then on to as president of Johns Hopkins, where we had a very fine, have a very fine school of public health uh, that is was well established and uh, has simply thrived in the years, even since uh, I was there. Uh, so I'll probably I'll probably say this again, but the University of Washington and that school of public health and community medicine, coming out of the Department of Preventive Medicine, with remarkable leadership in each of those divisions and with a university that was more and more enthusiastic about collaboration across disciplines, but already had a very strong track record, was one that made it pretty easy to recruit people like me who were skeptics at first, you know, because they thought they were in a great place. And then they came out and saw the opportunities in the Northwest and within the university and the culture of collaboration, of friendliness and, and a welcoming sort of spirit of fierce competitiveness in terms of national uh, grant funding and being the very best. And there's no question that we were all a very competitive lot on that faculty. But on the other hand, we viewed our role as supporting each other within, even as we were being highly competitive uh, beyond the university. And then, of course, the resources in, in Seattle more generally as they emerged. For example, I was on the board of the Regional Medical Program in the 1970s, and we received the first grant 
that established the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center as a national cancer center. And the, the links between the School of Public Health, uh, epidemiology, uh, biostatistics, and biomathematics more generally, and the uh, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center uh, were a striking instance of how mutual support could build both the departments on the one hand within the university and a fantastic uh, cancer center such as the Hutch. The uh, other thing that, that struck me as being very important to building the strength and success of the School of Public Health was that when the, when the change was made from the Department of Preventive Medicine with Tom Grayston as the chair of the department to the School of Public Health with Tom Grayston then as the dean of the School of Public Health, the, an approach was made to President Odegaard asking whether or not we could have a School of Public Health but have it be within the School of Medicine. And I don't know how long he pondered that one, but having been the university president, I know it probably wasn't very long. He said, no, he didn't think so. He said, we're going to have a separate school of public health and community medicine. But the, under the wise guidance of John Hogness, and the, who was vice president for health affairs at the time, before that dean of the School of Medicine, and Tom Grayston and others, the decision was made that there would be no duplication of the resources in the new School of Public Health and Community Medicine in the School of Medicine. In other words, if you were in anesthesiology and you were doing a study and you needed a, a, a statistician or you needed an, a health economist or you needed a uh, epidemiologist, you couldn't go out and recruit a statistician and put that person on your faculty by himself or herself. You had to recruit that person through the Department of Biostatistics or the Department of Epidemiology, or the Department of Health Services, or the Community Medicine Program. And the person could have a joint appointment in your department, as many did, but had to be based in the department which was the discipline from which the person was coming. And on the surface, that may not seem like all that uh, important of an element, but it turned out to be terribly important because it meant that the departments in the rest of the health sciences, not just medicine, but nursing uh, and dentistry, for example, as well, were not able just to go and, and select people who suited their needs, and, but, but were not first-rate individuals, but rather were more service-oriented uh, individuals. And so I've always thought that that was a, a hugely important element that, as far as I know, no other major university in the country has. And I, as far as I know, too, it still is a, an element, an important element of the success of the School of Public Health and Community Medicine. And, and that success, in and of itself, uh, is not just puffery or, or wishful thinking on the part of people who are in the school or uh, those of us who were in the school. I left in 81 to go up to the graduate school and then 84 to go to Penn State. You, it's it's uh, generally agreed across the country that the schools of, of medicine and public health were very strong to start with back in the 40s and the 50s. But as you look at our founding in 1971 and consider that it's not that many years later, and there are about 40 schools of public health in the United States, that the University of Washington School of Public Health and Community Medicine is uh, considered arguably third or fourth in the country. And uh, I won't get into a discussion of whether or not Harvard or Johns Hopkins are one or two, or two or one, since I have a vested interest in both. My um, oldest daughter having graduated from the School of Public Health at Harvard and my having been on the faculty of the School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins. But anyway, my, my overall point here is a pretty straightforward one, I think, and it is that the University of Washington School of Public Health has an extraordinary track record, and it's not by chance. It's because of phenomenally good people to start with who understood the principles of how do you maintain strength through highly competitive people. 
in the national research uh, scene in terms of research funding. And, uh, on, and on the other hand, collaboration within our own school and the other schools in the health sciences and on the upper campus in order to build very, very strong programs. So that's sort of an overview, I guess, maybe covering four decades, really, of the uh, school as it started as a division and became a school and now is one of the top three or four schools of public health and community medicine. But maybe, maybe it would be useful if I just went back and, and talked a little bit about some of the my recollections of the people who were involved at the time and the way the uh, leadership and the student body uh, emerged during the 11 or so years that I was in the school. So I said at the beginning, I started as an assistant professor and as director of the graduate program in health administration and planning, whose name I think has been changed since then perhaps to health administration and policy, I'm not sure. Within three years, we had graduated that class that we recruited before I ever got there. I mean, I came out and interviewed those students, those prospective students, selected the class, and then they actually started a quarter before I arrived on the scene. We, we started out with, with that, you know, very uh, basic structure and we had an economist on the faculty and a planning person on the faculty and a health administration person on the faculty so there were four of us all together and three years after I came Bob Day became the Dean of the School of Public Health and Community Medicine and so a search was started to look for the new chair of the what was now chair of the Department of Health Services and which within it had the program in health administration and policy and community medicine with Betty Gilson leading that uh, as well as a number of other uh, research programs and activities and we went through a search process and as it turned out while it hadn't been my intention the uh, search committee and and the dean wanted me to serve as chair and so I agreed to do that and so I served as chair of the Department of Health Services during that period from um, 1973 to 1976, I think it was. I had I was also along the way do a sabbatical because when I left Chicago, I was supposed to have gone over to uh, Lambeth in London to do some community, some population-based work on health indicators there, and so I was able to line up the funding and was all ready to uh, take my sabbatical uh, when after about three weeks I got called back and said well somebody had left and would I be willing to fill in in this instance I think it was as the acting chair of the Department of Environmental Health and I said to Bob Day well what do I know about environmental health except that I know a little bit about sanitary engineering of course and he said well he said he said, you'll, be a, you'll fill in just fine. And he said, and it'll be good for you to be in a department that has a science basis and a group of people who are interested in, uh, in a different set of sciences than you're accustomed to. And he was absolutely right. I don't know how much I contributed to the department, but I learned a tremendous amount during the time that I was there, including the uh, very interesting work that we were doing in occupational health and you know, OSHA having... Um, really just taken hold within the last previous decade it was it was very important to the state of Washington and so we had very major funding from the state as well as federal funding to deal with the whole range of issues of occupational health as well as environmental health more generally particularly uh, for example emissions for those who are living in uh, small uh, structures and prefab homes and so forth uh, who were thought to be at risk, and we did a lot of work on that. Uh, and even down to the question of whether or not the spray that was being used in the aerosol uh, by hairdressers was a risk. Uh, and, and that up to the larger scale issues of, uh, of water supply and uh, environment more generally. We also had a collaborative program with the upper campus 
as, as the School of Medicine did in genetics, as a matter of fact, that brought together environmental uh, interests on the upper campus into environmental health uh, in the School of Public Health and Community Medicine. We built strong ties with the School of Dentistry. Doug Conrad, for example, a, a very uh, capable and successful economist uh, with an interest in that area, again, based in uh, our school, uh, a graduate of the program, in fact, and going on then uh, to do tremendous work in economics of the, in the dental professions and dental, dentistry more generally. So there was, uh, I moved back and forth a little bit. Uh, when Bob Day went to the, what was at that time, the Healthcare uh, Financing Administration, as is currently CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, uh, for a sabbatical. I took over as acting dean, and that gave me a chance to get a, a better feel for uh, what was going on in the dean's office. I ended up in 1976 becoming the associate dean, uh, and when Betty Gilson stepped down, and that was a very interesting experience for me. It wasn't one I was particularly looking forward to, because by that time I had several large research projects going on, uh, probably with 150 people or so working uh, on on those projects. And we were doing uh, the model cities uh, analysis in which we had major surveys uh, going that allowed us to ferret out the comparative uh, advantages and the characteristics of fee-for-service medicine, both physicians and hospitals in the community, where we were able to actually get in uh, to 600 private physicians offices to abstract their medical records for the 4,000 patients who were within this model city's uh, community-based project and the hospital records of the same. And then the other uh, group of model city's patients ended up enrolling in group health cooperative and so we had access to all of those medical records as well. So we were able to abstract the records and had very good data on what happened over a period of four years to several thousand model cities and rollies. Model cities was uh, was Seattle's and King County's approach to what were neighborhood health centers in other communities. Uh, the idea was to buy into the existing system rather than to to create new uh, capacity. And those those studies went on for a long time. We had wonderful people in community medicine, like Jim Legerfo, for example, who was also uh, a faculty member in the School of Medicine. Um, we had interest by Paula Deer, particularly in the Department of Statistics, as well as other members of that department, uh, epidemiology. Uh, it, it was just a very broad-based, typically University of Washington School of Public Health and Community Medicine venture, where we had a team of people, Diane Martin, um, he headed it up as the project director, trying to understand what happened to people when they got into the system, who went and who didn't, and why. And in the case of Jim Legerfo, the first really intense focus on quality of care, which would come back to influence my career 20 years later in a very major way. Uh, but one of the things we were able to do, for example, was to look at four surgical procedures and to try to understand through uh, interviews by all of these uh, enrollees uh, as well as the, the records that we had to try to understand why the procedure had been done in the first place, whether it was appropriate to have done it or not necessarily appropriate and what the outcomes were. And through that, we were able to compare prepaid group practice, which was a very hot topic by that time nationally, with the uh, del services delivered by community physicians and hospitals. One of the things I remember about that particular part of the study, it was a big, a big study uh, that involved costs and so forth, but one of the things that I remember very well was the fact that we had groups of surgeons drawn from group health and from the community who set up the criteria for when you should or shouldn't operate in each of these four diagnoses. And they were exactly the same. 
which shouldn't surprise anyone because they all were trained at, um, at U.S. accredited medical schools. And so whether they ended up in group health or in private practice didn't say much about whether or not their what their medical training was. Their, their medical training was essentially the same as long as they went to uh, good schools of medicine, which they had. At the same time, when we subsequently had them review the abstracts of what the workup was, what the diagnosis was, what led to the diagnosis, and then they would turn a tear open a, a tab and see what it actually... So they'd make a judgment as to whether or not surgery was indicated. And then they would break open a tab and see what actually had been done and what the outcome was. And then based on that, they would make a second judgment. In retrospect, should the surgery have been done? Was it was it needed or not? And it was the, the issue really here was uh, necessary versus I mean putting it very crudely necessary versus unnecessary care uh, and intervention. And again, when you when we had both physicians from the community and physicians from group health l making these judgments se separately. I mean they didn't discuss them among themselves, and although they subsequently did. And it was very interesting that, the, that you could not tell where the physician was from in terms of the judgments that were made. In other words, the judgments on what the criteria were and the judgments on whether or not what was done was should have been done or should not have been done were the same among the physicians in the two groups. But there were substantial differences between the two settings, the prepaid group practice on the one hand and the community physicians and hospitals on the other, as to what in fact was done, and there was both under and un there was o under and over provision, if I can put it that way, in both the community setting and in group health. In other words, the Wenberg findings of years later, showing that um, those decisions are not all based on the clinical conditions that are presented at the time, but on larger organizational and economic factors could really be seen clearly in uh, in these data. So that was one that was one dimension of my life as a faculty member in the School of Public Health uh, and as as a as a part of, uh, as a faculty member with several large research programs going. Another aspect that uh, also was sort of characteristic in my mind of what was going on in the whole School of Public Health in our department as well as in the other four, was that we were very committed to engaging our students in community and in the work that was actually going on in the field. It was not as is true, was true then and perhaps still is, uh, focused on a didactic approach where you had the students in the classroom and you lectured at them for, for a quarter or a semester. It was very much a, a proactive, uh, engaged learning kind of experience. And so, of course, we had the formal coursework and all that goes with it. But we also, in my own case, I made sure that the students that I had as graduate students in classes, even larger classes of, uh, in, say, 40 or 50 students, we made sure those students were out in the community actually with mentors experiencing what it was we were talking about in the classroom and coming back with reports. And in the case of the health administration and planning students, uh, those in health administration had to go out and spend substantial time at hospitals and come back with a, a detailed report on the various forces at work on the hospital, strengths, weaknesses, uh, characteristics, and what role the hospital served. Another a very important aspect, I think, of our teaching was that John Honess and Tom Grayston and the directors of the departments had decided that we were going to be the department serving the medical school in these various areas. And the, what that meant was that the courses that would normally have in a medical school have been taught by faculty member within, members within the medical school rather than, say, in a department of uh, public health, uh, epidemiology, statistics, whatever it might be, were all being taught by our faculty. And that's where the medical students got their training. 
we also had a lot of postgraduate work going on jointly as well. So that meant that I had a responsibility for part of a course in the medical school that was taught to all second year medical students. Now this was under the whammy uh, system. And so the first year of these students were in Seattle if they were from, the, from uh, Washington or possibly Washington State if they were from the eastern part of the state. They were taught their first year in Idaho, in Alaska, and in Montana. The only time that they were all together for a year as one big class was their second year medical school. And so there were a number of us who taught courses to those students. And they were courses that they would not have been able to get from the experts and expertise that we had in the School of Public Health, that the earlier decisions had not been made, that that was the way it was going to be. And then they went back out for their um, clerkships and, and experiences, field experiences, as well as their first major clinical experiences, back out into those uh, communities in the Whammy region. And then, of course, the residency programs as well were oriented that way, since the evidence showed that residents tended to stay in the geographic area in which they were trained. And so the whole idea was rather than those states having to build medical schools of their own at great expense and operate them, that if we could do it at the University of Washington, then they would provide the support for us and for the residency training and clerkships out in those areas. So, for example, in community medicine, Betty Gilson's work in a rural area with migrant health workers all supported that kind of experience for medical students as well as students in public health. I haven't said too much about the, the collaboration between the various schools and the way some of these degree programs worked, but let me, let me start just by saying a little bit about the program in health administration and planning because it's, a, it's a, sort of the quintessential example of the way, in my judgment, this sort of a program should work. We had our coursework uh, spread across the campus, the required coursework. So, for example, our students had to take coursework in the Graduate School of Business, or in the Business School, in that case the graduate uh, component of it. They had to take coursework in Public Affairs. They had to take coursework in other parts of our own school. And so, it, to cobble that together was mostly something that would be done based on sort of goodwill and, and collaboration and allowing students to get into the courses of the other schools. But for example, in the School of Business, the seats were very scarce. And so we needed our, we needed our students at the master's level to be able to get guaranteed access to the mainstream courses in the School of Business. And that required the business school to be partners with us. And so right from the beginning, when we wrote those early grants, we talked about what was called a group degree which is what, we were, what our goal was, which was to have a degree that belonged. It was based in the graduate school. It belonged to the business school and to the School of Public Affairs, as well as to the School of Public Health and Community Medicine. And it belonged to, to the faculty who were in the groups. And the group was made up of faculty from those schools and some others. And I led that group. I chaired it. And we worked hard towards developing a curriculum and a student body and, in fact, the ability to demonstrate that it would work, which is why I wanted those students to start early, as I mentioned some time ago. And by the third year, we had gotten a completely separate degree, the Master of Health Administration, through all of the hoops within the university and then to the uh, State Higher Education Board at which I testified, in, with, accompanied by the president of the university, in order to get state approval for that new degree. And we were successful in getting approval because we had shown that the various other schools of the university were willing to participate in this group degree. That being based in the graduate school, we all had a home as a faculty responsible for that degree. But then we also demonstrated that we had, were able to attract very good students on the one hand and that we were able to provide administrative support, which we did within the Department of Health Services. 
And so that became a, a very important uh, milestone for us. And to this day, the Master of Health Administration is a degree that involves the faculty uh, from all across the campus and the opportunity for them to do their course, or for the students to do their coursework in those other schools as well as in the School of Public Health and Community Medicine. Thinking about the uh, success of the MHA, one of the key elements that, I, again, I think I mentioned earlier is the idea of having a, a home base. And the home base for that, obviously, was the graduate program in health administration and planning faculty within the Department of Health Services. We had other examples of that, too. Uh, MedEx, for example, uh, was a very important program within the department that Dick Smith originally uh, established. But then Dave Lawrence uh, came along subsequently and took that over. And we, there were actually a, a flow of people uh, through the department. And you always ask, well, if a person comes and then leaves, why, why did he or she leave? And you always hope that it's for a good reason. In Dave's case, he went on to become the health officer for Multnomah County in Portland. And then from there to Kaiser, where uh, he ended up as chairman and, and chief executive officer for the, the Kaiser uh, system throughout the United States. Extraordinarily successful, just retired recently. Uh, and then, uh, with again, within the department, just the, the progression of these various programs in which we had tremendous success in recruiting, and then instances of people who went on to very distinguished careers. For example, in the, in the health administration and policy program, when I became chairman of the department, we needed to recruit a replacement for me, obviously, as director of the program. And we were able to boil it down to, without any question, the two best people in the in the country at that time. Uh, one was Steve Shortell, uh, who was, would have come from the University of Chicago, and the other was Bill Dowling, who was on the faculty at the University of Michigan. And when it came down to the final decision, we I'm sorry to say, and delighted to say, I guess, we just couldn't make a decision. I mean, they were both so good that we had to have them both. And so I remember going to the dean and persuading the dean that we needed extra resources so that we could have both. And uh, that's the way it turned out. And Bill Dowling stayed in Seattle and uh, contributed uh, to the community through the hospital community and planning and administration and back to the school, and always connected to the school and the program uh, as a very important uh, faculty member. Steve Shortell uh, came and served as a faculty member within the department for a number of years, did a lot of very important research, a very, very successful and popular teacher, and then, and, and had worked with me actually at the University of Chicago uh, when we were both graduate students, and then went on to Northwestern in a name professorship, and from Northwestern on to Berkeley, where he currently serves as the Dean of the School of Public Health at Berkeley. And so there's been a, a, a very good ability to attract people and then in some cases, as in my own and others, to see them move on but into positions where they can make a difference. The, uh, in my own case, moving on was an interesting phenomenon. During the period that I served as acting dean when Bob Day was away, I ended up as a member, therefore, of the board of deans with the president and the provost and the uh, senior vice president for the health sciences. And I, I hadn't really given a whole lot of thought to what went on in the rest of the university except as it related to our programs. But that, that gave me a chance to first get some exposure to the rest of the university. Second, to find out what a terrific group of deans the university had. I had known Reba de Tournier, of course, and her wonderful husband, Rudy, and since they had come up from the University of California, and we had worked together on, on a number of things. And I, I had known uh, Milo Gibaldi as dean of pharmacy and the deans of uh, social work as well as, as dentistry, but mostly just through the professional connections of our mutual program interests. But it was a totally different scene when I was a member of the Board of Deans that first time 
and seeing people, uh, all of whom are very accomplished, working together on university problems and trying to address issues that the provost, the dean of the graduate school, uh, and vice provost for research, the vice president for, for uh, management and finance and business, uh, and the president working together on some really uh, challenging issues. And one, it led to my being involved in a couple of things I probably wouldn't otherwise have been. One of them was that the university had a, an IT system, an information technology system, particularly with respect to management and finance, that was centrally operated and whose purpose, as far as I could tell, was largely to serve the needs of the university with respect to the governor's budget office and the reporting uh, to Olympia, because we were, as far as Olympia was concerned, we were treated as though we were just another state agency in many ways. And so we did not have a system, unlike many other universities were developing, that was intended to be internally responsive from a management point of view to the people who were bringing in the uh, resources by competing successfully for uh, grants and contracts. And I remember as a, as a principal investigator with the number of grants that I had going at any given time, that it was very hard to keep track from, you know, one month to the next, never mind, you know, one three-month period to the next, where the resources were going, whether you were within budget, who you could recruit, how many people you could afford, what you could do out in the field. So cost control, um, resource management, all of that was very difficult without uh, the, the capabilities that we take for granted today with our financial systems. And so one of the things that I pushed very hard for during the time that I was on the Board of Deans was that we reorient ourselves to the people who were actually out the faculty, the people who were out in the field doing the work, managing the budgets, managing the programs, department chairs who are managing their departments, and to give them the resources in a timely fashion so that we could have an effective and, and uh, efficient operation that maximized those resources. Well, that was kind of a challenging idea but the pro for some. But the provost, uh, George Beckman, who was one of the best I've ever seen, put together a group, and I was pleased to be able to play a leadership role on it. And we worked for at least a year coming up with a, a redesign of a system that would be adequate to serve the needs of the university in Olympia, but would be more oriented towards uh, the management of the university itself, because after all, it was the largest public university in the country in terms of research funding, and, and as far as I know, still is t today, just as Hopkins, uh, Johns Hopkins is among all universities. So you need a system like that. So that gave me exposure to a whole different part of the university than I had ever known. And these were administrative people, high-level, bright people, working uh, in, a, in a whole part of the university that I didn't even know existed. And then another uh, opportunity that it gave me was the, the provost, George Beckman, uh, was bothered by the fact that we didn't have a department of statistics in the entire university, even though we had some of the best statisticians in the United States. We had the biomedical uh, biostatistics uh, program, which was joint between our uh, Department of uh, Statistics within the School of Public Health. We had an applied math program, which was very good. We had a statistics group, but it was just another division within the math department. And yet here was this huge university with all of this research activity going on, and we had no Department of Statistics. Now, the good news is that we had statisticians at the senior level who got along well and who knew that they had to collaborate effectively. But they had there were two PhD programs, three if you count applied math, and particularly in the statistics case, they tried to keep them at parity in terms of the quality of the students, the quality of the, of the requirements, and the expectations with respect to dissertations. But still, they were separate departments and therefore not equal, if you will. And so the provost set aside some very scarce resources, but substantial enough to start a department. And he asked me to chair a small committee to bring it to pass. And no one else seemed to have been able to bring it to pass after years and years of talking about it. But it helped to have those resources backing me up. And I remember 
making the rounds. We had the dean of engineering, uh, who was very suspicious of the whole thing, and particularly giving up the applied math engagement that he had, and the Department of Arts and Sciences, uh, to the degree that that they, uh, you know, it was rather small potatoes by their standards, uh, to the degree that they were into it, um, was a little concerned about the math department giving up statistics. The math department certainly was. And I wondered within our own school of public health and community medicine, how those, uh, when it came right down to the crunch, how those faculty members would feel about having to give up some of their autonomy in order to have a statistics department for the university. And so I worked and worked on that, and we finally designed a program that was going to be excellent. We were able to recruit an outstanding person, really outstanding person, to chair it from the outside. And it came down to the question of resources and were people willing to pool their resources. And I remember talking, I'm pretty sure it was to Dick Cronwell, who was a wonderful guy, uh, and who ran the, the uh, biostatistics program, whether or not he would be willing to give up control over uh, the fa a couple of faculty positions that were coming his way and put them into the statistics department. And he said yes, he was. He thought it was that important. And that said a lot to me not just about the importance, but about the, the statesmanship of, of Dick, I mean, who was just, a, as I said, just a terrific guy, is a terrific guy. And so everything was lined up. We had the resources, everybody had agreed to it, the curriculum, all the PhD students were going to be taking the same exams, so there could be no question of you know one being tougher than the other or more rigorous than the other. And we had agreement from the Dean of Arts and Sciences, and we had an agreement from the Dean of the School of Public Health. And I went and talked to the Dean of Engineering, and he didn't want to do it. He didn't want a separate applied math program. And he didn't want to give up the control that they had in terms of the statistics department. And so he refused. I had a document that I drafted, sent around, and everybody agreed to, and he refused to sign it. And we were under a lot of pressure because we were coming up to a new, a new biennial fiscal period. And so I tried to think, well, what's the best way to, to make this happen? I mean, after all, I'm just an ordinary faculty member. It's not as though I'm a dean or something. By this time, I was back to my uh, faculty responsibilities. Bob Day had come back from sabbatical. And so I thought, well, probably the best way to do it is to just put it in my drawer and not do anything. Because I had promised the provost that by June we I would deliver him a Department of Statistics. So I just didn't do anything. I just put it in my drawer. And oh, I would say around the end of the first week of June, maybe maybe the second week of June, the provost called me up. And he was an imposing kind of gruff figure, frightened a lot of people. And he he said to me, he said, where's where's the statistics department? He said, you're supposed to be delivering me a statistics department. And I said, I thought you told me you had all the paperwork done. And I said, oh, George, I said, I just feel so badly about it. I said, I do have it all done. But I said, I cannot get the dean of engineering to sign off on it. And I said, I certainly didn't want to send you a document that was missing a signature and put that onus on you. I mean, I was the one that took the responsibility for getting it done. And he said, you mean to tell me that this whole thing is being held up because he isn't signing off on it? I said, that's right. I said, there's nothing I can do about it. I'm just a faculty member. He said, I'll take care of it. Well, in about 15 minutes, the dean of engineering called and said, where's that paperwork that I'm supposed to sign? I said, he said, I don't know where it's gone. And so I said, well, I have it right here, and I'll send it right up. And within a matter of close of business that day, we had a statistics department. So that taught me a little bit about university politics and how to get things done without creating any more of a scuffle than you need to. So, that, so there were some things about the job that were, and the exposure to that board of deans and to the wider university that were kind of fun. 
And uh, so that then sort of naturally led to the response that happened when I was heavily, I had two heavy recruitments at that time. One was from the University of Chicago who wanted me to come back as a tenured full professor with a very substantial endowment for space and graduate students and so on. And so I talked to them about it and went out and visited actually and came to the conclusion that Chicago still was not the place for me compared to what I was being able to get done at the University of Washington and, and, and as I'll come to in a minute, particularly the chemistry of the School of Public Health and Community Medicine. And so I said no to that one. And I, I never mentioned that to anybody. I didn't, didn't want, I mean, it wasn't a you know, sort of thing where you're asking for more support because you'll go somewhere else otherwise. But then the, then the School of Public Health at Columbia deanship was open and they really put on a full court press to get us to move to New York. And we went out with a family visit and our girls and Nancy and I went out and they put us up at the Algonquin and a two bedroom suite, all the kinds of things New York people do. And the, and the energy and the pressure, I had been in New York from, as I said earlier, for a year. And so, it, I mean, there's just, your blood flows about three times faster in New York. And I like that. And so I was pretty interested the family was kind of like Seattle and the San Juan Islands, where we're on Shaw Island, where we're speaking today, as you can see if you look out the window behind me on Blind Bay. Anyway, we kind of liked it here, and the family especially. Well, meanwhile, unbeknownst to me, George Beckman had heard from a colleague of his at Columbia that they were talking to me about recruiting me to be dean and that it was looked as though it was pretty promising that I probably would go. And so he got a hold of me and he said, Bill, he said, you don't want to go to New York to be dean of the School of Public Health at Columbia. He said, you know, in due, in due course, Bob Day will end up probably uh, doing something else. Or he said, there are two other schools that have deanships coming up that you'd be qualified for. And he said, and then there's a dean of the graduate school and vice provost for research. And he's about to retire sometime in the next couple of years. So he said, I can't tell you what. But he said, just take my word for it. He said, you stay put. And, you know, the chances are, it'll be up to search committees. It's not up to me. But he said, the chances are that things will work out. So actually, it didn't take too much arm twisting, just a nice lunch off campus with George Beckman was enough to persuade me that I probably better stay put. And so I did. And that, and as I reflect back on it, I'm, I'm reminded again of just how important that 10 years of experience with colleagues in that School of Public Health and Community Medicine had meant to keeping me there doing that job. It, it's hard to put into words, but when we first got there, the warmth and the welcome of Donovan Thompson in Georgia, who didn't live too far from where we had settled. And they just made us feel as though that the University of Washington was exactly where we belonged and always would. And they were just wonderful to us and, and to our kids. George Kenny, who had us over for lunch after church and was just, and, and when I was, and the F wing always, he just made me always feel glad to be there. I mean, he was just that kind of a person. I must admit that the second or third year I was there, I used to come into the building in the, through the, that tunnel on the F wing from the parking structure and then take the elevator up. And I did get mycoplasma pneumonia and was very sick. I've never told anybody this, actually. I think in the privacy of our home here up on Shaw Island, I can tell you. But I certainly wouldn't have said anything about it at the time, it probably was an occupational hazard. But anyway, I was very suspicious about the, all the work that had been done on mycoplasma and the fact that I ended up going home with mycoplasma pneumonia. I was the only person then or now that had ever heard of even having it, never mind getting it by walking through the F wing corridor. But anyway, George Kenny was just, just made me feel glad to come to work whenever, whenever I saw him. And then as you think across the faculty, many of whom you've met through this series. I mean, you just couldn't help but be glad to go to work. And uh, 
Of course, one of our all-time favorites is Betty Gilson, who passed away just a few weeks ago and, and who is the reason that we're on Shaw Island. And she and John brought us up for the first time in 1972 or, th or three. And I remember saying, Betty, the last thing we need is more recreational property. She said, oh, no, it's not to buy it. She said, we just want to show it to you because it's such a wonderful piece of land and waterfront. And so we trooped around the periphery of this wonderful 26 acres, and we knew when we got on the ferry going back that Betty Gilson had just drawn us into something we weren't expecting in her wonderful, charming, loving way. And so we spent a lot of years with our kids not far from Betty up here and enjoying her and John and uh, and then visiting her when she moved to Friday Harbor. You know, just thinking about Betty Gilson and what good friends we were, there, there was a period when I was serving as chair of the Department of Health Services and Betty was the associate dean of the school under Bob Day. And I had to go in and talk to her about a curricular matter. And it was fairly urgent, as I remember. And Be Betty had, during that period, a, a bad back. And so when I went in to see her, she was lying flat on her back on her office floor in the dean's office. And she said to me, I hope you don't mind, or I hope this doesn't bother you, but she said, I've got this back problem, and I'm supposed to lie flat on a flat surface f for periods of time. But as it, she didn't know this, but as it, as it happens, I know how to stand on my head. And so I said, oh, not at all. And so I just rolled into a headstand about two feet from her face, facing her, with my feet straight up in the air, and I said, I'll tell you what it was I came in to see you about. And we had a conversation that went on. I mean, she was having a hard time from laughing, which she ultimately couldn't resist. And I started in on what I was trying to get done and why I'd come to see her. And finally she started to laugh, and she said, don't do that. She said, it's hurting my back to laugh. <laughs> and so, so I got into my normal position to petition the dean for something or other. It was... Uh, one of my warm and fond memories of, of Betty Gilson. But again, I only go through, through that because it's so emblematic of the kind of warmth and caring and spirit that went with this tough, competitive, nationally and internationally successful group of people. And so when George Beckman came back to me and encouraged me to talk to the search committee for the dean of the graduate school, and vice provost for research for the university, that it was natural that I would that I would be interested, and I did talk to that committee. And it's a strange thing. I don't know if how many people this happens to. It certainly was strange for me. The search committee was meeting in the regents' room. I walked up the stairs, which I had done many times as a member of the board of deans when Bob Day was away and I was acting dean. And I walked through the president's outer office to the regents' room. And I just had this gut feeling that this was the right thing to be doing. And I met with the committee. George Beckman called me a week or two later and said, well, you're number one on the committee's list. And he said, you're number one on my list. You need to talk to the president. So I went in and talked to Bill Gerberding, who was the president at the time, and of course did a fantastic job over the years that he was at, active at the university as president. And I remember the first thing he said to me when I sat down, he said, why on earth would you want to be vice provost for research and dean of the graduate school? And I said, well, I don't know. I said, you tell me why, <laughs> what would I want to be? I said, I think it's because of the experiences I've had coming up to this building and seeing what the rest of the university is all about. And I've always been a curious person. And this is a chance to, I hope, contribute in terms of my research experience and, and research administration and competitive funding and, and the Washington scene, which I've been very involved with, Washington, D.C. And um, so I said, it just seems like an interesting job. And he said, well, he said, it is. He said, I think it'll be uh, a good experience. So I took the job, and it st I started July 1st of 1981. And 
there are two or three things I remember vividly about it. One was that the graduate students in the entire university were about to go on strike. And it was a serious strike. They weren't just bluffing. And so the first thing we had to do was get the leadership of this group in to have them explain to us what it was that, that was causing them to feel the need to go on strike, all of which I happen to agree with, and then to figure out a way that we could get the job done more effectively with them not going on strike than going on strike. And somehow that, that managed to work. And then I, that was within the first week. And then I remember also in the first week, I had an interesting experience with my assistant, invaluable assistant, who many, many people in the School of Public Health know and who's currently assistant to the dean, Holly Weiss. And she had come from being my assistant at the, in the School of Public Health up to the graduate school in the uh, administration building. And again, I remember Bill Gerberding asking a very interesting question because this was not usual. It turned out that the person who had been uh, Ron Jabal, my predecessor's uh, assistant, was, was retiring. So it was a perfect opportunity. And he said, well, you're bringing Holly up here. I mean, supposing it doesn't work out. And I said, well, I don't have to worry about that. Holly and I have worked together for a lot of years. And I said, so there isn't much doubt about that. And so Holly had many wonderful qualities, but one of the ones that I always appreciated was that she'd read the mail when it came in. And if, if there were letters to be answered that could be answered rel in, you know, in a relatively straightforward way, she would draft a response when she, as she sent in the letter. So that it would be easy for me then to send them back out with, if there were any changes, which there rarely were, you know, the, the letter would already be done. She was very efficient and is to this day. I'm sure Pat Wall would agree. Well, one of the letters was the first invitation I got to asking if I would consider going to a university and discussing with them and their search committee the possibility of being president of that university. And it was quite a good university. And attached to this letter, asking me this question, was the nicest response that said, dear whoever it was, how appreciative I am of your suggestion that I come and talk about being president of the university and so forth, but I've just taken up my current position in the last week or so, and so I'm just beginning this job, and it wouldn't be appropriate for me to leave after such a short time but I certainly appreciate being considered. And I thought, now there's a wonderful relationship when you know that the person that you're working with can read your mind and write exactly the response that you would have intended to write, except to have done it in a much more gracious way. So I, I didn't, wouldn't want this chance to pass without acknowledging the tremendous contributions that Holly Weiss has made and continues to make in the dean's office having gone full circle uh, to Penn State with her husband Al, to Johns Hopkins with Al, and then when I went to the Kellogg Foundation for that 10 years as CEO, Holly and Al decided it was time to come back to Seattle, and so they did, and came full circle, and then Holly's back in the dean's office, much to the benefit of the School of Public Health and Community Medicine that we all love. So that's, that was a... Uh, an interesting first experience. Another was to encourage multidisciplinary groups of faculty and students and graduate students in some cases to get together to create small groups of interdisciplinary, uh, doing interdisciplinary work without having to go through a long, arduous process of approval to set up such a group. or such. And they didn't even have to be degree groups. They, a lot of them were research groups. And it was a long time, a long process to get that done. And I changed that, of course, working with colleagues like Joe Norman, who was the associate dean, and others, uh, Norm Arkin, who was the assistant, who was just terrific, and uh, went on to, as well as Joe, to do terrific things. Joe went on to be dean of arts and sciences, and Norm moved up in the administration. So we, we came up with a different scheme. We said, we'll charter any plausible group that puts in a proposal for a limited period, three years or five years, and you can do your thing. But then at the end of three years or five years, you have to come in and show us what you've actually done. 
And if you don't come in, then the group automatically is dissolved. And don't, and that should not be an embarrassment to you because these things often don't work out. But we don't want you to have gone to all that trouble and then find out it didn't work. I'd rather have you get, try it. And then if it doesn't work, it just automatically disappears without anybody being embarrassed about it. But if it's working, come in and we'll talk about funding and move on from there. And so I mean, these are all things that, again, I was coming at it because I was first and foremost a faculty member. And in fact, as I went on to Penn State and uh, as executive vice president and, and provost of the university, and then on to Johns Hopkins as president, my rule of thumb always was think of, think of yourself first and foremost as a faculty member or a graduate student or a patient and think about how the institution is serving you and not the other way around. And I, not to be preachy about it, but I do think that to the degree that, that departments, programs, schools, universities, organizations of all sorts organize themselves that way, they're much more productive and, uh, and much more effective. Which brings me back full circle to what it was about the School of Public Health and Community Medicine that made it so special. And what it was, really, as, as I've reflected on it, was that the faculty, partly because of where they come from in the Department of Preventive Medicine, and partly because of who we recruited, partly because of the culture, always had in its mind, both individually and collectively, that we were there to serve the students, to make sure that the faculty were able to do their work as easily and with as little interference and as little um, bureaucracy as possible, and that to the, to the degree that we could put in place as administrative officers and, and as academic administrators, people whose first interest was getting the job done by the people who knew how to do it, and with high energy and high enthusiasm, that that was the best way to go. And that's what we did. And if you think about Tom Grayston, who was the first dean, and the work that he did as an investigator, he had the, he had the longest running RO1 grant, numbered you know, by its, its sequence of numbers year after year as it got competitively renewed of anyone I've ever known. I, I, the last time I was counting, it was 23 years, and that was probably 20 years ago. And for all I know, he's still at least got a keen interest in it, if not working on it. Bob Day was all about how do we help people? How do we find the right spot for people? How do we facilitate what we're doing for students and for faculty. What kinds of creative interrelationships on the campus can we think of? What can I contribute, which was an enormous amount, in terms of providing guidance and support to junior faculty? What can I do to help make linkages? For example, uh, when we had the terrible downsizing in 1981, in August of 81, of the university, because of the of the, collapse, the interest rates went sky high, and uh, of course, aircraft and forest products are all sold on time. So when interest rates go up, that's bad news for, at that time, for Seattle and, and, the, and the state of Washington. We had this tremendous crunch. And there again, I mean, you, had, you had this spirit of we're not just going to cut everybody across the board. We're going to make sure that we preserve uh, the best of what we have and that we do it in a way that's creative and, the, and it creates new opportunities. And so Elaine Monson, for example, in nutrition, much to the benefit of the school, even though that was a grisly time for that program that she was originally in on upper campus, and some things had to be dropped for financial reasons, out of it came the most creative people collaborating, working together, and making new connections, including epidemiology, the School of Public Health, and the School of Medicine. And while it's terribly painful at times, it's, it's terribly important to the success of the school over time or to the university over time. And from the president, Bill Gerberding, through George Beckman, and all of the deans, that was a period when people really put their shoulder to the wheel to make sure 
that we were preserving the best university that we could and to do it on the basis of strength and effectiveness and centrality to the mission of a great university that could be competitive with Chicago and Harvard and the Berkeley and the kinds of places from which we, in the University of Michigan, places from which we recruited our faculty and our, and for that matter, our leadership. Bill Gerberding having come from the faculty of, the, of UCLA before going to Illinois briefly. So I think that that culture and that spirit and that sense of commitment to individuals and paying attention to what people were actually doing substantively, not just administering, was exemplified by both Tom and Bob. And then Gil Oman uh, came along as dean. Talk about a bright, energetic fireball of a person who really understood and knew and cared about what people were doing and pushed them to do it. I mean, each of those three had, had quite different styles, but they all had the idea, the right idea, of, of how to make that school um, now in a field, as I said earlier, of 40, uh, you know, in the top uh, two or three or four, uh, and to make sure that I was reserved number one for Johns Hopkins, of course, or uh, Harvard if they have to be there. And to make sure that, you know, that we're, that we're, the, we're the best there is, and both internationally now with global health as a major interest, uh, and at collaboratively, such as with the Hutch and other uh, organizations in our area, and in terms of the collaborations of our faculty. So I think we've been blessed with wonderful leadership. I've personally and professionally was enormously blessed by Bob Day's warmth and uh, commitment both to the program he wanted to see started and to me as an individual and as a mentor all the way through. And then I got to know Gil Oman again when he came to the University of Michigan as the executive vice president for the health sciences during the years that I was at the Keller Foundation. And so uh, as I think about the path of my career uh, and where it ended up, which at the end was the Kellogg Foundation, whose interest is in helping people help themselves and in working in community and with community, whether it's students or health workers or indigenous uh, tribal folk in Latin America or in Southern Africa, or strengthening institutions that serve communities. It all, to me, fits together with the experience that I had at the University of Chicago and then strengthened and, and developed further in a very um, encouraging environment at the University of Washington, the School of Public Health and Community Medicine. And then I hope on, in my other roles, uh, to, to places where I could bring what I had learned and, and create an environment that was modeled after the success of our school.